do earmarks play in government? And we'll begin with Mark Wayne Mullen. Well, earmarks have become a dirty word. Uh, you know, they've been abused. They were intended for something, they were intended for infrastructure, they were intended to, to help the, 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 the uh, infrastructure of the United States to grow. But what's happened is you've got a lot of greedy politicians up there that wanted to build a bridge to nowhere so they can continue to be reelected, and they lost sight of what it was intended purpose was. Instead, they started abusing the system just like they always do. They started abusing the system to gain personal <coughs> Uh, gratification, I guess, so they could get reelected over and over again with favors to people inside their own district. You know, it sickens me that so many people that we elect go up there and abuse this great country for self gain. It's about service, and service means you're the least of everybody. When you decide to take your own responsibility, that means you're willing to do things that others aren't. It's one of those issues we see the human nature alive and well. And one, I told a group one night, they asked me, I said, Dwayne, if there was an earmark that would benefit our area for this particular purpose, would you vote, and it was in a bill, would you vote the bill for it? And I said, no, won't do it. And I'll tell you why. Because if every one of you was a representative, and then I do that, then why can't you do it? Then what happens is that everyone's got earmarks. Now we've, well, now we've sit here and taken our stinking budget down. Now we're spending money that, uh, outside of our budget, which we don't even have one. But you see where we're getting at? Why is it we keep coming up short? If we continue without earmarks, we can't say, well, it's for this purpose or this. Listen, if it's good for one, it's good for all. So you have to make a decision. What do you want to do? And the problem is, if we'll just get back to the Constitution. Let's get back to the Constitution. That'll take care of a lot of that garbage. cited one of our senators, our, our two senators have opposing views of this. You've got one that is looking at ways where they can spend more money on projects, and you've got another senator who's looking to cut government spending. In the financial straits we find in our country right now, it's time we cut the size of government. We, if a project is good enough, it ought to stand on its own merit, but let's cut the size of government and let's not, lock, not be looking for ways that we can spend more of our hard-earned tax dollars because every dollar the federal government takes and spends comes out of our pockets, not theirs. Well, it's pretty simple. Local dollars should support local projects. And that's why I'm against earmarks. If you read any of my material, it's been a total point of our campaign because we will never balance this budget if we keep earmarks in the budget. I think every one of us knows that. Uh, but local dollars, perfect example, one of Dan Warren's earmarks, $190,000 for three police cars enrolled in Oklahoma. People enrolled in Oklahoma, maybe some of them, one of those police cars, the ones that got tickets by the one. But the point is, those should have been local dollars from a local tax source that supported the purchase of those police cars. It should have been our product, federal tax. We all agree with that. But it was an earmark that came to Oklahoma under our current congressman. I'm against them. I think they're going to go away. We'll never balance the, beer, the, uh, the budget if we keep earmarks. Yeah. Well, I think on this issue, we need to ask ourselves what is an earmark? An earmark is a vote by Congress to spend taxpayer money for a particular project. Congress's job is to spend taxpayer funds. That's what they go to Washington to, to do. And if they don't do a good job, we have the opportunity to fire them. <coughs> so my position on earmarks is this. I want Congress to determine where our tax dollars are spent. I do not want a bureaucrat down on Constitution Avenue making the decision. I want Congress to do it. And if they don't do a good job, we'll fire them. We can't fire the bureaucrat on Constitution Avenue. So earmarks are not the problem. It's the way they've been done that are the problem. They're snuck into a bill at the last second, right before the vote. No one knows they're in there. If a project is worthy of taxpayer expenses, the, the bill should be put into to the uh, package. It should be put on C-SPAN. It should be debated between all the senators and congressmen, and you and me should be able to sit in our living room and watch the debate. If it's in the sunshine, it'll be a fair and open debate, and it's our money. We should deserve where it goes. We should deserve to know where it goes. And for that reason, I think it's the process, not the earmark itself. 
the issue was, was inherent in the question that you asked. It is a constitutional control issue. Who controls spending taxpayer dollars? The executive branch or the legislative branch? Spending bills come out of the House or passed by Congress. It is not up to the president to decide where he wants to put money. So if Congress gives him a basket full of money for the Department of Defense, but then the executive branch figures out where to spend that, where is your voice in that process? It's your representatives that should determine where that goes. It's already been alluded to that the problem has been judgment and wisdom and accountability to the voters. Don't conflate the two issues. We have to reduce spending. But you still need constitutional control over the little money that we should give the federal government, how that is spent. And that is done by being very specific on where those dollars are going. If you've got corruption, like a bridge to nowhere, that's a corruption problem. All right? It's not a process problem. So let's keep in mind the constitutional authorities. That's why we shouldn't have a line item uh, veto that the president has wanted, because he is trying to assume powers not delegated to him by the Constitution. Our next question will begin with Dwayne Thompson. Should you win the primary, what message will you give to the Democrat and independent voters in the district that will convince them to vote for you in November? Well, the message doesn't change. I mean, District 2 is conservative, uh, Democrat and Republican alike. And ha having met a lot of those, and dealt with a lot of those, and talked to a lot of those, they understand what I'm saying. When, we, when I say and I'm talking about addressing the root problem, they understand that as well. That, that's not a Democrat-Republican issue. That, that's a moral issue. Now, if, if we want to think that those on their side of the fence don't have an R before their name are, are totally different from the moral issues, then I'd say we're wrong. But they understand that as well as we do. So my message doesn't change. Um, I've talked to them about that. They understand it, they believe it, and they accept it. Because they, they know, just like we do, that if we don't address the root problem, then, then the issues are going to keep bouncing back around because it's always going to be uh, a party and all these other things that they're making decisions on, not making decisions on what's going to benefit we the people. Well, for me, the message doesn't change as well. I've already proven that I can win in the Democratic district, and it's because of the conservative nature. It's because of my voting record. It's the reason why Mike Huckabee endorsed our campaign, because we have similar values that are up and down the second district. We are conservative. And sometimes we get worried because we're worried about the initial after our name. You know, good policy and good government doesn't always have an initial after it. It's conservative in its nature. People believe in limited government. That's what they want. They want the government out of their way, whether they're Republican, Democrat, or independent. As a state representative, I've represented them all, and even those folks who aren't registered because they're citizens of this state. We need to have people who are willing to go up there and be a servant and reach out to everyone out there and represent them to the best of your ability. Our leave the people in the second district are concerned. And I believe that all along. Uh, when I was in the state legislature, I ran a bill twice to make all the county offices nonpartisan. I don't care what party this year. I don't care what party your county clerk or court clerk is. Democrats killed that bill twice. Uh, now that same bill was heard uh, last year by the Republicans, the Republicans killed it. Uh, the reason why is because the, the Republicans in Oklahoma City and Tulsa, they want to keep their status quo. I think if we could pass that bill, uh, this state would see a huge re-registration and we would not have the problem we have today in the 2nd District. It would have been more than two to one there. But uh, I worked on issues that I found uh, common knowledge, common uh, uh, feeling with. Uh, a couple of senators or Senator Representative Paul Rome from Tishomingo, Jerry Ellis from Valiant, uh, two guys that I worked with on the water issue. And uh, we found commonology with, the, with that issue and worked on those issues. I'll represent the people of the second district on issues that are important to the people of the second district. Well, at the end of this process, we're going to have one Republican and we're going to have one Democrat. And we're going to have a Democrat tell Eastern Oklahoma voters, which the registration is 70% Democrat, that because they're Democrat, they should vote for the Democrat. And it may be a likable guy. We don't know who it will be. But what do we know about Congress? The first vote that you cast as a congressman, January, you go to Washington, you're sworn in, 
you vote for Speaker of the House. And the Democrat has to vote for the Democrat. And the Republican has to vote for the Republican. Ladies and gentlemen, I will proudly tell all of the Eastern Oklahoma voters, even though I haven't signed any pledges or made campaign promises, I can tell everyone without any question that the 2nd District of Oklahoma, if they send me as their nominee, will vote against Nancy Pelosi to be Speaker of the House. And I can't tell you. I bet you can't find a Democrat that would disagree with that in Eastern Oklahoma. <laughs> recently found people who are in almost independent thought. You know, they're going for the man and the message, irrespective of party. Again, my 30 years, I've got to repeat this, has been working as an American for the long-term interest of the United States. And both administrations, uh, Republican and uh, Democrat, have had to get things done with either party that's been controlling uh, houses of Congress and administrations. I've had to work with Americans from all across our land, from all different sectors of our country, and, and you set before you an objective of what has to get done, and you get that thing done. Most issues, the solutions are in the 80% common ground. But our environment has gotten so hyper-partisan, and it's been dominated by the extremes, that people can't come to the same table. So my adult life has been about getting people around that table, whether you're in a sandbox in Iraq, or you're at a conference table in Washington, D.C., or you're dealing with federal law enforcement in the center of the country, you name it. And you find where that common ground is that advances the ball down the field for the common good. And those issues that you can't decide on are usually at the periphery, you can set them aside. I've had experience and success in doing that. That kind of message has been resonating across all 26 counties in this district. And I'm absolutely confident I would be able to take the general election. Well, the uh, question I I don't have to relate. You just listen to me speak and hear my accent and know I'm from District 2. Uh, we have too many people that are trying to relate with people from District 2. You know, I've been kicked by a horse. I've worked until my hands have hurt day in and day out. I picked up rocks until the tip of my fingers have bled. I understand the strong work ethic. I understand our issues because I've been there. I've done it. And you know, when you're talking to people across the district, they don't care if you're Republican or Democrat. Right now, it's about getting the economy back on track. It's doing what's right. It's putting America's best interests in mind. And so don't think that it's just going to be voted down party lines. We've seen it time in and time out in Oklahoma that people vote on the person. And this district is no different. We're just looking for people to represent us. And I'm telling you right now, I can represent us, and I'll represent us well. Our next question will begin with George Thought. What is your favorite recreational activity? <laughs> what is that anymore? <laughs> oh, well, you know, it used to be a lot. I uh, used to play a little bit of golf as a time stealer. I used to fish a little bit as a country boy. Um, our family has backyard volleyball games. Uh, that's, probably, that's probably one of the things that we do as a family. Uh, you know, even now, I tend to get a little bit of ball hog. The thing about uh, backyard volleyball games are you build teamwork, you build uh, camaraderie, you have rivalries, and uh, I'll tell you what, the best thing that we found out last year, snow volleyball can't be beat. All this can go, and it's just too much fun to die for those balls. So uh, volleyball is probably a favorite of our family.
and uh, it's, it's been a family activity. My kids ride their bikes with us as we run. And it's something you can do wherever you live. And it doesn't take any money. Just buy a pair of tennis shoes and hit the road. So we, 